Okay, so looks like we're ready to start here. Um, this is a design stream. I am uh, streaming my design process for uh, this m module, this uh, OSR module uh, that I've started writing called uh, To the Halls of the Stormlord. Um, it is <coughs> a module for the game Macchiato Monsters. Um, this is, you can see it right here. The black and white hack. Um, it is a OSR game, uh, or an old school renaissance uh, game, which, uh, you know, is a school of, of tabletop RPGs that uh, imitate the original uh, Dungeons and Dragons and sort of elaborate on that style of play. Um, it's something that uh, the Gauntlet is fairly well known for, uh, and that's kind of how I got into playing these kind of games and uh, designing for them. And this is actually the first uh, product that I've designed for an OSR game. So it's it's really a new process for me. Um, yeah, so as far as... Uh, the module goes what uh, what I'm initially thinking of here um, I have a pitch that I wrote uh, so it says dark and sorcerous clouds gather above the high peaks of Shafurzan the dukes assemble a stranger offers counsel the fair weather company is created to pacify the storm a host of adventurers is summoned to form its ranks. The great mountain is scaled. The outsider watches, and she waits. So that's just a kind of dramatic setting that I have for this uh, adventure. Um, and as I describe it, it is a dungeon crawl module with character funnel elements. And so a character funnel is a module in um, especially OSR games where it's expected that a lot of your characters are going to die. So one of our design goals um, here, design goals will be make sure there is high lethality. Yeah, characters should die. Um, that's part of how this should work. Uh, the player characters are members of the hastily assembled Fairweather Company, who have been promised honor and treasure if they can placate the menacing storm atop Shathurazan. Uh, they are, in fact, unwitting pawns in the war between fearsome giants and the cunning gods. So these are the two factions that we have in play here. Um, the Stormlord Arnmunder one of the mightiest of the giants, has rammed his sky fortress into the dwarven fortress built into Shathurzan, and is using the planar gate the dwarves constructed in order to summon forth the storm that threatens the nearby lands. He plans to use the energies of the storm to forge a god-slaying spear, but the duration of his labors will devastate the area. So there's our sort of grim portents. This is, or this is, uh, you know, the 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 bad thing that will happen if the PCs don't succeed, right? There's there's the stakes. Um, in response, Uglahildr, Valkyrie in service to the gods, has traveled in disguise to the area and plotted to create the Fairweather Company to use as her battle host. Her deception is that she knows very well what is causing the storm and that the adventurers stand little chance in defeating the Stormlord and his followers. The rabble of the Fairweather Company are merely candidates that she has determined to test and to reap for souls to join her host of Ein Herjar, the undying warrior thralls of the gods. Uglahildr will elevate those PCs who die in battle on their quest, and only those who die in battle, to the status of Ein Herjar in exchange for their mortality and their freedom. Uh, she plans to use these Ein Herjar to fight Arnmunder and seal the storm portal. So, 
we can see that uh, Ugla Hildur is the real protagonist of this story, right? <laughs> uh, Ugla Hildur sets everything in motion. Um, well, I suppose Ardmunder's amazing, uh, you know, ramming into the mountain maneuver kind of got things moving. But she's really the ones who have got the PCs on their quest. She's kind of the, P P uh, the PC quest giver. But she's also the one who's really got the main stake here, which is to defeat uh, Arnwunder. Um, so one of the things I think that is interesting about this situation is that the PC context, uh, the player car character context, um, and the situational context, there, there's a little bit of a dramatic irony, right? Because the PCs think they're going up the mountain to stop the storm from happening, right? There's some weird sorceress storm happening on top of the mountain. It's threatening the surrounding lands. Go take care of it. That's their mission. Uh, we'll give you some gold and, and treasure and, and, and kudos if you can go do this for us. Um, however... Uh, they're really getting involved in this kind of uh, blood vendetta that exists between the gods and the giants. Um, and as they play, they should become increasingly aware that uh, Ugla Hildur has a agenda for them um, and that they are not really the masters of their own destiny. Whether they ultimately decide to work with her or not um, is something that obviously is going to be decided in play. Uh, but she has a lot of initiative and has more information about the situation than the PCs do. Um, I also like the idea that uh, in a way, uh, Ugla Hildur is kind of a... OSR character in a slightly different context, right? She's more powerful than any of the PCs, but she's really trying to outthink her opponent instead of just being a badass and going and uh, standing them down and fighting them, right? Um, so I think that is um, interesting, especially as you move towards the end of the module and possibly Ugla Hildur ends up fighting beside the PCs because then it's kind of like their relevant context becomes closer and closer as you move towards the climax of the module. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. That's fun. A lot, lot, of, lot of interesting situations going on here. At least I think so. Um, so the basic structure of the module is the first segment is scaling Shathurazan, the mountain. Um, so this is going to be uh, probably the lowest stake section of play, but also, you know, clearly has a distinct uh, type of flavor. I'm thinking that the dwarves have probably uh, shut themselves up in their fortress since a long time ago, and the roads up to... Uh, the fortress of Shathur Doom uh, are, you know, disused, falling into uh, disarray, uh, disrepair, and there's going to be some environmental challenges that the PCs will have to get through in order to get up on top of uh, Shathurazan. Uh, the second leg of the journey is to explore the ruins of the Dwarven fortress of Shathur Doom. Um, so this is going to be a place where uh, there'll definitely be some some traps, some dungeon ecology, like different uh, groups involved. Uh, maybe some some of the dwarves are working with the giants. Some of the dwarves are holding out and trying to maintain their independence. Uh, there's you know dwarven creations like uh, golems and and other kinds of like uh, strange. Uh, mechanical and magical beings that uh, are roaming free now that the, the, the fortress is in disarray. Um, it's things that came through the portal, right? Um, and finally, the, the climactic stage will be entering Arnmunder's Sky Fortress and confronting the Stormlord. And um, my sort of real inspiration for uh, this idea of 
uh, one location rammed into another location is uh, the... Oh, I can't remember the name of the stage, but there is a stage in um, uh, Dark Souls 2. Uh, it's one of the first areas you go to. Um, and, like, I think there's, like, a giant... Uh, what was it? Like, there's, like, some kind of giant building or spear or something that's, like, rammed into this fortress. Um, and I really like that idea of, like two different forms of architecture that have been just sort of like geologically sandwiched together. Um, and I think that that could be a lot of fun. And I'm also looking to kind of play up the um, contrast between the interiors of the Dwarven Fortress, which are, you know, small and cramped and built to Dwarven scale, um, and then the the interiors of Arnmunder's Fortress, which are built to giant scale, right? So, like, I really want that environmental context and the, the changes of it to be evident in play um, and to create a kind of uh, uh, a sense of, of world building um, and to make that evocative. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so uh, NPCs. Uh, we have Ugla Hildur, uh, the Valkyrie. She appears in many guises, um, and she manipulates events to her advantage. She drives a hard bargain, and she is fearless and cunning. So, you know, El Ugla Hildur will fight Armundur one way or the other. She's fearless, but she's also smart, right? She's not going to just go and do it. Um, yeah, so... Uh, as far as the appears in many guises thing, I'm definitely going to come up with a list of a, a ways that she can appear. Um, so Ugla, Ugla is a, a word that means uh, owl, I believe. Um, uh, so it uh, it it see. So that's a, that's an inspiration for me. Um, what it what I'm thinking for her is like, you know, one of her appearances will be like uh, a woman, like a young woman who appears clad in like only a robe of owl feathers, like snowy owl feathers. She'll also definitely appear as an owl. Um, she'll appear as like a badass Valkyrie, of course. Uh, you know, like she's going to have some cool armor and an awesome magic weapon and all that kind of stuff you would expect of, of a Valkyrie as well. Um, and maybe there'll be like one other guys that she can appear in. And those are just going to be like listed off in a box for the GM to, to draw on. Um, next we have Arnmunder, the Storm Lord. Uh, he is a giant. He is a bold leader. Um, and he desires revenge against the gods over all else. So he desires, he has a single minded desire for revenge. Um, and this just kind of goes off of uh, standard Norse mythology stuff, right? Like, we're moving towards Ragnarok. Um, the gods got their power and built the current world by murdering a giant lord. Um, and uh, the giants are pissed and they want revenge, right? Like, that is standard Norse mythology stuff. Um uh, next character we have here is uh, Zarok, uh, the chief engineer of the dwarves. And I'm trying to use uh, dwarven names here that are uh, based off of uh, sort of like um, variations or developments of the sketchy uh, dwarven language that Tolkien came up with. Uh, but, you know... I'm not a I'm not a linguistics nerd. I'm not I'm not really that interested in being faithful to Tolkien, but like I think that the the difference in linguistic roots for different names is evocative, so I'm trying to use that. Um, and uh, he is forced to work for Arnmunder, so I still have to think about why is he forced to do it? Like what is the leverage Arnmunder has over him? Um, and he's not happy about it. So, you know, a possible ally, right? Uh, but he's a dwarf, so he's he's greedy. He's um, he's uh, you know 
uh, inward looking, suspicious of outsiders, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also uh, very clever and uh, capable. Um, there's Dwarven Survivors. You're going to need to come up with like a small cast of characters there. And then Armander's Followers is the one that I'm really the most um, the most sketchy on. Uh, I think he's probably going to have some kind of cool daughter uh, or maybe a son. Um, a nephew could be interesting. Uh, that, that could also be fun. Uh, but I want some I want some followers for Armander who aren't just giants, right? Like I want some hangers on. So I, I want a little bit of that in this in this module. Um, then I have some mechanics here, uh, which I haven't really fleshed out entirely yet, but I have the, the basic ideas. Um, so to start with, there are the mechanics for the Ein Herjar. Uh, so when a PC dies in battle, uh, not to a trap or poisoning or, or falling or anything like that, uh, they have to die in, in battle. Uh, they will roll the die of fate, so that's a d6 uh, on a success, so that is a 4 to 6. Uh, they will be revived by Ugla Hildur, who will get 3 hold over them. So hold is like not a super OSR thing, it's more of like an apocalypse world thing, but you know, I think it works pretty well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll with it. Um, uh, which she can spend to revive them from death or compel them to do something for her. Um, so it's it's either a way for her to, uh, you know, restore the PCs in combat with uh, the giants uh, or to get them to do something against their will. Um, and, and, you know, this is really important characterization for Ugla Hildur, I think, right? That she, she is not uh, an entirely sympathetic character. Um, an Ein Herjar gains three levels upon transition. So essentially getting levels in a normal OSR game, especially in a funnel, uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, you expect your character to die at level one. But um, instead, uh, I really want them to get this sudden boost in power that like puts them if not on an even footing with the giants, at least like makes them competitive with the giants, right? That like they, they stand a chance of fighting them um, and no longer requires rest or provisions. Uh, so again, this is, this is really important because uh, we're gonna be talking about um, environmental stuff and uh, encumbrance and rations and all that kind of OSR stuff. So this is, this is something that actually matters, or it should matter. Um, so, like your um, like rest and um, supplies should matter uh, because this is an OSR game. Um, uh, but they can no longer gain XP. So, like they they've lost their mortality. They've lost their capability to grow as individuals. Um, <laughs> I see I see Sid's in chat. Hi Sid. <laughs> and talking about uh my owl references. Yes, I have made an owl reference. Um of course I did. Of course I did. Um and uh yeah, so I was originally thinking maybe this would be a torchbearer game. Uh maybe this would be a torchbearer module. Uh but there was an issue with this idea, which is um, using Torchbearer would kind of go against the um, the idea of this being a character funnel and, and the focus on character death. Because Torchbearer is a game about your PC's suffering. It's not a game about your PC's dying. Uh, it's hard for your characters to die in Torchbearer, it's very, very easy for them to become, uh, you know, messed up, right? That's what it's about. So so I thought that was like, okay, like Torchbearer is not really going to work for this, as cool of a game it is. Um, um, I, and so I decided to go to Macchiato Monsters. So in Torchbearer, there's something called Order of Might, which is something you use to compare your power level to other beings. And I think it's a super amazing system. Uh, it's it's so good for 
establishing stakes and like keeping a level of separation between individual PCs and the great and mighty magical beasts of the world, right? Like a dragon should be a dragon, you know, it's, it should be a big deal. It should not be something that you, that is just like a big pile of HP that you fireball to death. Um, and I think Order of Might is awesome for that. But um, instead, uh, we're going to be relying on Hit Dice, um, which, which uh, Macchiato Monsters uh, does something with, right? It's not as sophisticated as Torchbearer, uh, but at least if you have lower Hit Dice than something, you are rolling at disadvantage against it. So that does represent, in the mechanics somehow, uh, the distinction between a adventurer and a giant right um so yeah so the the pcs will gain levels and then that means they have the option to increase their hit dice and then if they do that they will be closer to being on parity with the the giants that they're facing um and uh, when the PC becomes a Nine Harriar, the player must describe what memories Uglehilder takes from them with their mortality. Uh, so this is, you know, really not an OSR thing, but um, it's it's more of, I don't know, it's, it's more of kind of like a story games thing or a PBTA uh, uh, thing. Like this is something I would put in a custom move in, in Dungeon World or something like that. Uh, but I like it. It's important. It's thematic. Um, it shows that it 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 um, so it, it it maintains that distinction of worlds between the world of the gods and the world of mortals, right? The world of of our everyday concerns and our life stories, and this this uh, kind of titanic conflict between these these mighty powers. Um, and it, and it's kind of evocative for me of like, uh, uh, princess Kaguya, right? Story of princess Kaguya. She goes back to the moon. She has to, uh, give up her memories. Um, so yeah, it's like you lose something even when you gain this power. Uh, I like that. That is important for me in this, uh, whole thing. And next we have the storm. Um, so I'm going to be replacing the uh, weather table uh, from Macchiato Monsters. Um, we're still going to be using risk dice, which means uh, as you roll uh, one to threes, uh, the situation becomes progressively more dangerous. Um, the lower numbers that you can roll will be more severe weather. Um, and it's just like it, it, it escalates. And the storm is going to have you know, significant mechanical effects or uh, significant fictional positioning to um, really keep up the pressure on the PCs. And I want to I want to encourage the GM to make the weather like a core of this um, this situation. Right. Because this is about going to take down a storm giant lord and you know, the, the, the initiating event is a storm. Uh, and I, I want that sort of, uh, danger to be clear. Right. And so, you know, like I have images in my mind of, uh, like, uh, going through the Dwarven fortress and like you open up like this, like blast door into a main hallway and like somebody just gets like sucked out of the, um, room by hurricane force winds and and like goes flying off to their death right like I want that kind of disaster movie style uh, um, force of nature stuff to be going on so the, you know like show the force of nature um, is, is going to be a design goal here uh, and we're going to rely on this uh, the storm table uh, because this is an OSR game, <clears throat> using uh, tables and random generation is still super important. Okay. Um, so that's the pitch. I think it's a pretty good pitch. Um, 
But uh, I want to talk a little bit about my inspirations for writing this. Um, so there's not a whole lot, but um, it's, it's worth talking about. So the big one is obviously Valkyrie Profile. Um, yeah. Uh, so in... So Valkyrie Profile is a uh, Japanese RPG um, for the PlayStation 1, and then they did another one for uh, the PlayStation 2, and then finally a DS one and a mobile game. Um, one of the things that uh, Valkyrie Profile does that's really, really interesting is um, it makes the Valkyrie into um, a like more sympathetic and interesting character, right? Because Valkyries are usually just like, they show up, they look awesome, and they carry away the heroes, right? Um, or they kick some ass. Uh, it's, you know, eh, it's okay. It's kind of flat. But what... Uh, what Valkyrie Profile does is um, with the character of Leneth, right? It, it's it's uh, this really great uh, setup where you start out as this the servant of the Aesir, uh, the the Norse gods, um, and you're going you're you're sent on a mission by Odin uh, and Freya to uh, collect uh, Ein Heriar, Um in order to uh, prepare the armies of the Aesir for Ragnarok. Um, and you're on this this countdown timer, right? Um, but as you play, you start to learn that, if I remember correctly, Leneth uh, used to be a mortal. And when she became a Valkyrie, uh, she, was, she was made into a Valkyrie, and um, she lost her memories. Um, right. And so you can see like, she's, you know, she's crying here. Right. Like, so this is, um, this is really like the, the, the central, uh, thing that distinguishes her from mo most Valkyrie characters is that, um, she has like her sense of honor, her sense of duty. Um, she's quite severe, uh, and all of those things you would expect of a Valkyrie, uh, but there's also this like soft side of her, right? Which is her regrets and her like mixed feelings about the gods um, and uh, her, her, her feelings of loss, right? Uh, and her, her wondering about herself. So you can really think about um, Leneth Valkyrie as a, uh, the fantasy version of Motoko Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell, um, I think at least uh, she's she's very much in that mode of character. Like she's a total badass, but also she has this like sort of you know deep uh, existential sadness and wondering about who she is and her separation from mortals and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, Leneth, uh, I think is, you know, one of the, the coolest characters in, in video game RPGs, um, and, uh, was a huge inspiration for trying to write this module. Um, but I don't think that Ugly Hilder is really li much like Leneth. Um, she is more like, uh, Leneth's, uh, sister. Um, her sister's name is, uh, Christ, I believe. Yeah, Hrist. That's right. Um, yeah, Hrist Valkyrie, uh, who's just like a much more severe and straightforward character. Um, you know, committed committed servant of the gods. Um, but what I, I wanted to do was kind of um, like transpose that. I mean, okay, so there's this really great thing about... Um, Valkyrie profile where you have you play as Leneth and you go around and you recruit these Ein Heriar. Um 
And every time you do it, you recruit a new character into your your sort of cadre, your your party. Um, you get like a scene about their their life, the way they died, uh, their regrets, um, the people they're leaving behind, um, and that. That, that really says a lot about Lanith because it's like the people that she takes to become Ein Harriar aren't necessarily very happy about it, right? Like they, this isn't, it, it's not like she's, she's an angel carrying them up to heaven. She's taking them away from the context of their lives and putting them into a situation of becoming soldiers in this army uh that they don't really have anything to do with personally um and i think that's like a major inspiration for this um ein harrier mechanic in that i'm trying to do here um and then of course the great twist that you see as you go through the rest of the game is that what leneth is doing to others is something that has also been done to her right like it's like oh shit like oh man the context ah uh and yeah then she gets real sad um but yeah Hrist is a straightforward character i think ugo hilder is more like Hrist, and um i think that uh the whole thing about the regret and the distance and all that kind of stuff um is going to be more on the pc side right it's that thing about being taken out of your life um so I, I want this to be i want this to hit i want this to be good um yeah so aside from that um we need a cool mountain <laughs> obviously uh and we need a cool sky fortress so have that going on um the written uh, references that I'm looking at here uh, are obviously uh, Macchiato Monsters. That's that's the main rules reference I have. Um, we're going to be working with that. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of <clears throat> other uh, references that I think are, are important to um, what I'm doing here and, and were inspirations. Uh, so... Uh, one of them is uh, Stone Dragon Mountain. Um, I think the whole uh, the whole ascent, um, the ascent of Shathurzan is very much <clears throat> very much inspired by Stone Dragon Mountain. Um, I've seen the mountaineering thing done in other games, like um, I've seen it done in like uh, Tomb of Annihilation in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, but I think that, that uh, Stone Dragon Mountain does a really cool job of uh, making that kind of mountaineering stuff interesting. Um, so this is a big reference uh, for me on that end. Uh, aside from that, uh, we have uh, Midormark, uh, which is another Torchbearer product. Um, and... This is just like a really straight down the middle um, Norse mythology fantasy setting uh, that is very, very well done. Uh, very well done. Uh, and knows what it's doing, does it well. Something I've only really, like, I've read through the book. I reread the book today uh, to get ideas. Um, but... I haven't really played uh, enough in this setting yet. I haven't played Torchbearer enough, but there's still a lot of ideas I'm taking from here. Um, you can see here, uh, this is the... Uh, we got some... There's so many cool pictures in this this game. Like, right here, we can see the, the, the first giant being murdered by the, uh, the gods. Um, very cool. Uh... And uh, I believe her name is what Sigrund. 
uh, prayers. Yeah, Sigrun Shieldbreaker. Sigrun Shieldbreaker, she is like, you know, this awesome warrior queen who is kind of like the William the Conqueror of this story. Um, and uh, she has a very cool magic sword called Skofnung. Um like, you can look at this item description here. Uh, a two-handed sword of meteoric iron scrawled with iron runes that spark with etheric lightning. Skofnung was the legendary blade of Sigrun Shieldbreaker. It is possessed of the spirits of twelve berserkers, and wounds inflicted by the blade will not heal unless first rubbed with the Skofnung stone. Uh, Skofnung is presumed lost in the bottomless depths of Sigrun's mirror. Um, and like, you know, Sigrun's mirrors kind of feels like a callback to like mirror mirror in, uh, in Tolkien. Um, pretty cool. Uh, and the effects, uh, in kill conflicts, hit points lost due to attacks from Skofnung may not be recovered by defend actions. In addition, shields used in defend actions against Skofnung are automatically sundered and disarmed. Injuries inflicted with Skofnung will only heal if they are first rubbed with the Skofnung stone, a whetstone in Skofnung's uh, scabbard. You cannot suck up wounds caused by Skofnung without the Skofnung stone. Uh, so it's like super lethal weapon. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, obviously the, the, the drawing here, the art here is badass. Um... So, so much detail. Uh, and so this, this whole product was a big inspiration for me wanting to do something like Norse-ish. And like just the, th this like opening, um, the, like the history, the opening history here is, is so evocative. Like, uh, I mean, you, like this, this whole section to start with, like I actually did like a recording I did a reading of this opening because I thought it was just so well written. Um, <laughs> um, you can go watch that on my Bandcamp if you feel like it. But uh, uh, aside from that, the the actual history is pretty cool. Um, it says, uh, "From the void, before time began, an endless void lay between the worlds. There, Orgelmir." First and oldest, progenitor of giants, ruled over a wicked brood from a vast throne of ice. After an interminable age, three siblings among the old ones, the first immortals, still worshipped as the lords of creation, determined to end Orgelmir's evil. They gained Oge Orgel sorry, Orgelmir's presence by stealth and fell upon the giant, slaying it. The old ones then formed the land from Orgelmir's flesh, the oceans and seas from its blood, the mountains from its bones, and the trees from its hair. Above all, they set Orgelmir's skull as the sky dome. They set the newly formed earth spinning in the void that it might serve as a crossroads of sorts for those that would travel the worlds. And at its axis was the meter mark and Midmather, the world tree. At last, the old ones departed. Orgelmir's wicked children maddened with rage and fear, found the secret places of the earth to hide and plot their revenge. The Asar, immortals who claimed lineage from the Old Ones, built a great fortress in the shining realm beyond earth that they might defend against Orgelmir's brood. Long ages have passed, and many have come to call the earth home. The immortal Alfar, uh, uh, exiled from fair Alfheim, uh, the Dvegar, said to be shaped of the maggots that infested Orgelmir's dead flesh, the hoodle folk, hidden and unassuming, and humans, youngest and most numerous of the peoples of Earth. In all that time, the meter mark has been awash in blood and strife, held by one people or another for a time, even long centuries, but always fitfully. Um, so just awesome, awesome setting description, 
really nice uh, ad adaptation of uh, Norse mythology. Um, even though, like, if you... Another sort of, like, big inspiration for this is just, like, uh, Neil Gaiman's... Um, I don't know what you would call it, like, retelling or <laughs> summary of Norse mythology. Um, which is probably like equally fucking awesome. Um, <laughs> the, the creation myth in that is so good. Uh, I just love it. Um, and great words, lots of very cool sounding words like Gnunga Gap and, uh, <laughs> and Yggdrasil and stuff. Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, so anyway, stylistically, sort of like world building stuff, that's all going to be at the back of my mind. But the thing is, I have very, very little text to work with. So I'm going to have to be terse, but evocative. Um, Torchbearer, um, I think it's, I mean, the main inspiration there is sort of like the importance of the order of might. Um, and... Aside from that, I don't think the inspirations are that direct on what I'm doing here. Um, just because, as I said, this is a character funnel and that's not what Torchbearer is about. Um, another one is uh, Veins of the Earth. Um, Veins of the Earth uh, is a OSR module. Um, it is really, really well written. Um, yeah, and I mean, you, you just kind of have to read <laughs> this thing <laughs> if you're interested in OSR stuff, because it's, it's really cool. Um, you know, just like this monster description you can look at, uh, Buddha was wrong. The Hindus are wrong. History does repeat itself, but then it stops. It's all going to come to an end one day. The stars will burn out, time will stop, and God won't slurp it all back and vomit it out again in a different pattern. That's it. There is one anti-phoenix and only one. It's written on this page. There is no other. It came alive when you read these words. You can use this black phoenix in your game. It's the only one you'll ever get. When it dies, if it dies, tear out this page. Take it outside. Burn it. There can never be another anti-phoenix in your game or any of your games ever again. Things find their meaning in their end. For a thing to live, it has to die. For a thing to exist, it has to not exist. No end, no meaning. The anti-phoenix is the end, final and irrevocable. When it dies, even the terms used to describe it will fall like old leaves. A rainbow of darkness. In normal glows, the anti-phoenix burns. A Hiroshima storm of A-bomb raven wings. The negative image pinwheel. A whirling dancing archive of every imagined color of black. An oil slick vast and far as you can see, that holds the light from one bright star in the empty carbonized sky. This is the lesser image of the anti-phoenix. Douse the light and its true form begins to reveal itself. As old darkness falls upon the eye, the rods revolt and cones rise up. They crackle slightly in the black, reluctant in sleep. Like dreaming dogs they twitch. Absolute blackness can't be seen by us except in contrast with light. Unless the anti-phoenix is there. Its absence rides the blackness, infiltrates the eye, and inverts the signals in your optic nerve. The background gray recedes. A deeper darkness seems to grow, a shadow in a shadow, a storm cloud in an eclipse sky with slowly growing shape and form. The light-sensing cells in your eye spasm and freak. 
Instead of sending signals to the brain, they start demanding energy to live. The brain responds and amps up your eye nerves with sustaining volts. The eye stops receiving energy and starts to gently glow. Your pupils loom. Simply looking at the creature in darkness is slowly draining your mind and life and soul out through your eyes. It's nothing personal. This is just the effect the anti-phoenix has. It's not trying to kill you, though it fully accepts your death is inevitable and absolute, like all of death. No one who dies at the claw of the anti-phoenix, or around the anti-phoenix, or even thinking deeply about the anti-phoenix will ever come back, by any method, fictional, metafictional, or divine, ever. The anti-phoenix is a master of words, and generally sad. It only speaks and cannot be reached by any other form of communication. An expert in poetic forms, it knows all forgotten tongues and none that live. To talk to it, you must learn a language, ruined and extinct. Only then will it allow you the slightest attention. It knows everything that has passed, most things. All that will die, most of the rest, and a bit about immortals, doesn't like them, fakers. It ends things, sometimes things that like lives and hopes and loves, but also sometimes curses, tyrants, and pain. It sometimes wants things. Old poetry is a favorite. Lost things, memories, highly secret and deeply lost artifacts, powerful but significant. Decoding its instructions is the hardest thing about working for it. Every single part of its body is extremely valuable and extremely dangerous. The kind of people who would want these parts are all uniformly terrified of going anywhere near it. No ghosts nearby, ever. They are too scared. So this is <laughs> this is a not a usual sort of OSR thing because it's very verbose, right? Um, and that's something I can't do in this module, but I can have really cool things like the treasures that are mentioned here, right? Um, something that's really important in, in OSR writing is to focus on having treasures that are interesting. Uh, so I really want to keep that in mind. Um, and another sort of reference uh, important thing that I've been thinking of is uh, uh, Kazarak uh, from Plundergrounds, Ray Otis's Plundergrounds series. Um, this is a Dungeon World module, um, so it's not really an OSR thing, but it is about a very cool Dwarven fortress. Um, so that definitely figures into, and even uses a risk die, like we saw in uh, Mac Macchiato Monsters. Um, so this definitely figures into the second stage of the adventure. Um, and uh, in a similar vein, uh, Juntu's Floating Ice Hell, uh, which is also a Dungeon World adventure. Um, and it features an unstable uh, elemental portal, uh, which is, and again, another feature of this, this module. So um, I think this... This um, this dungeon world module taught me some things about uh, how I might want to structure this adventure. Um, for example, having three stages that co correspond to three different sessions of play. Um, but I think it's also pretty messy. So I'm not um, I'm not really looking to take this uh, as a model for style or how to write the uh, module. I think this 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 um, this module is still very much struggling to understand how to write a, a, a module for Dungeon World. It, it feels like it has one foot in OSR stuff and one foot in Dungeon World stuff and it doesn't really know how to reconcile the two of them, but has a lot of cool ideas. So uh, definitely going to um, draw on that. Uh, and then the last thing I think that I've been looking at here is, um, 
Richard's uh, Richard Rain's um, the wreck of the void hatred from Codex Cold, the Gauntlet's uh, Codex Cold. Uh, so this is another uh, OSR module for the Gauntlet um, that is very terse, straight to the point, right? It's one, two, three, four pages long. Um, I kind of have to aim for a similar length here. Um, and uh, it it's interesting because it is doing OSR without any maps. Um, it's doing it without any uh, detailed sort of um, description of how the different parts of the module fit together, uh, which feels like a, a quite a, a dungeon world kind of thing. And um, it also still manages to be very OSR. Like there's this focus on treasure. Um, obviously it's written for an OSR game, Swords and Wizardry. Wizardry. It's not the one I'm using, but uh, it's, it's very much like adjacent, same family of games. Um, and uh, it also relies a lot on randomness um, and is designed in such a way that the randomness, um, the randomness, so like, if you think about the way that a D20 module is written, um, so something uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, third edition onward, um, there is a lot of sort of like text that deals with the sequence of play. Uh, but if you look at um, the text of this, this module, uh, you'll see that like the big bad does not get their own entry in the text, right? They just get this little box down here. And I think there's like another like minor description. Where is it? Ah, yes. Right here. Look at how small this is. A small avalanche of rocks and ice covers the bridge. Anyone searching the rubble will find the upper half of Bale's severed body. So he's the captain of the ship. Uh, one hand on his sword, the other on the wheel. Anyone with a dagger can remove the heart in 2d4 rounds, but Bale's body awakens and attacks. And then, it's not even clear you're going to meet his ghost because this is a random event, right? You could you roll the 1d10, you see if you get a 10, then he might show up. But maybe he won't show up. You don't know, right? This is, there's, there's a certain situation that is presented, but it's not like dictated that you have to follow a plot arc. Like this is just a possibility that might happen. But maybe something different will happen based on the way the dice go. So you have to respect the dice in um, an OSR game. And I think that's something I'm going to struggle with writing uh, because um, I'm very used to uh, writing dungeon world um, sort of scenarios uh, for play, for, for my personal play. Um, and I try to really follow a clear plot arc. And you can see in the way that I've written uh, the pitch here right there's like three stages and it's kind of implied that you're going to end up in the end uh facing down arnmunder um i don't not really sure if it would work uh otherwise um but i at least want the parts in between to be very random um to to have flexibility to to uh uh, work off the uh, consequences um, of what's going on uh, of in the in the situation and in in the uh, the setting we've created. Um, so I feel like this is going to be some kind of uh, some kind of mashup that will be using OSR mechanics, um, mostly be using OSR style of writing. 
uh, but we'll definitely have some influences from PBTA um, and and uh, that kind of style of writing as well. All right, so the last thing to talk about, well, I should actually write this down too. Um, I should write down uh, respect, respect the dice, respect the dice, but remember the conflict. Um, yeah, remember the, 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 the core conflict. Okay, so um, last thing to talk about here uh, is the Principia Apocrypha. Uh, so this is something by uh, Ben Milton and Stephen Lumpkin. Um, created, presented, and expounded upon by David Perry with miscellany from Bryce Lynch and Chris McDowell. Uh, it's really, really great. Uh, summary of OSR gaming principles that makes sense to me as a designer and somebody coming from PBTA games um, that and it helps me to sort of understand what I need to be shooting for as a designer uh, to um, make this really like an OSR product right and not just uh, not just dungeon world with a few OSR flavorings, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm not going to read through the introduction or anything, but I do want to take a look over these principles. Um, so the one, there's rulings over rules. That's for basically how to GM. That's not, not really terribly relevant to us. I mean, you know, one thing to say is that we're not going to be making a whole lot of custom moves like you would in a PBTA game. Um, I feel like I'm gonna have that one move for the Ein Harryar because it's just like, eh, I I want that in there. I don't want to leave that up to the GM. I want that to become. Um, oh, thank you. Somebody mentioned that the Principia is by uh, Dave Perry. So credit to Dave Perry for this awesome document. So. Uh, Something uh, to mention here, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have that one sort of custom move that's gonna be in there. I just I don't want to leave that up to the GM. Um, as for uh, XP for treasure, very important, right? This is really really important. This is a huge difference with a lot of other fantasy role playing games. I need to focus on treasure. I am not good at this in Dungeon World. I don't do this well. I am, I uh, as a GM, um, I am always focused on characters and setting, and I'm not focused on treasure. So I need to learn, or I need to push myself to come up with cool treasure, uh, such as we saw in Meter Mark, right? We saw, like, the, the, the items... Um, the weapons or, or the, the the magical items that we saw uh, at the or in here are really great, and um, I need to make things that are like uh, on this level, you know, um, interesting stuff. I can't give these these long box text descriptions of their background, but they nevertheless should be very evocative uh, items. They shouldn't just be like, oh, you get um, sword plus one, no. Forget that. That's useless. It's no good. Uh, these these the treasure has to be enticing. People have to want to get the treasure. Um, and another thing that is really really important uh, is that um, I have to remember the mechanics of the game are going to encourage the players to get in, get out, and steal what they can. So I have to remember that the reward for finishing the quest has to be a significant amount of treasure um, that would actually be of interest to the players. Um, I need to remember that uh, 
I'm going to have to create either a situation or other mechanics that will strongly encourage the players to actually fight uh, Arnmunder because um, as it stands in an OSR game, and I, I've played uh, World of Dungeons a fair bit, and I understand this, um, you're not necessarily interested in in fighting in fighting enemies, right? You're you're mostly there to get treasure and to get out. Um, so I have to remember that this this conflict is somewhat under motivated by the normal mechanics of an OSR game, and I have to think through that problem. Um, this is not a uh, standard D20 module or a Dungeon World thing where you have uh, some some really really strong sort of like quest to fight this guy. No, your your characters are whatever they are. They're they're scoundrels. They're adventurers. They're not you know paladins on a quest, or at least most of them are. Um, to to defeat an enemy. Uh, okay, so another one. Uh, here uh, is to divest yourself of their fate. Uh, so, again, very, very different from PBTA games, right? Um, you are not an antagonist to the players or characters. Um, players or characters, right? Uh, that's also very different from Burning Wheel. Um, absolutely different principles about playing. So, honestly, portray the world and its denizens as they would react to the character's behavior, don't intend to orchestrate the character's actions. Well, Ugla Hildur is directly trying to orchestrate the character's actions, right? <laughs> so it's important that she be a convincing denizen of the world and not a instrument of the GM, right? So she needs to act out of her own motivations in portraying the world as something that is divested of the GM's responsibility to present opposition, right? Um, so this is, this is, again, something I need to like work on and think about because I'm, I'm still kind of thinking from that angle of like, the players say what kind of people they are and then you as the GM push back on the things that they um they are or they they want they desire they they represent challenge them right challenge their beliefs challenge uh what they stand for uh that is a different style of play from an osr game and so i need to think that way um leave preparation flexible uh this is again important so i already talked about this this is this is mainly about like not over plotting things not uh scripting Build responsive situations. This is really, really important. Um, this uh, is going to be absolutely crucial in setting up the Dwarven Fortress. Uh, it's also going to be really important in, as I mentioned before, uh, making the conflict that at the heart of the module convincing and something that is interesting to the PCs. Um, so establish situations with multiple actors pursuing their own ends. Okay, like I've, I've got that down. I have that framework established. Um, let the player's actions affect this environment and have those changes affect the players. Uh, then let the situations worsen if the players don't address them. Okay, so, you know, we have the storm, right? The storm will get worse if the players don't address it. Um, as far as this... Let the player's actions affect the environment and have those changes affect the player. This is going to be something that I have to, to think about, right? Um, I have to leave that open to the GM and the players to figure out themselves. I'm not scripting it. Um, and yeah, so you can draw a grid that maps the relationship between the elements of a situation, how they relate or interact. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, but I think this is a sufficiently simple scenario that I wouldn't, I'm not going to do that right away. Um, embrace chaos. This is about the randomness that I was talking about, um, but uphold logic. So this is maybe where I can I can say that the, the overall motivating conflict has a place in this module. Um, 
If there is an obvious reason for a particular wandering monster to be here, that's why they're here. Don't bother rolling a random activity or reaction. This can help maintain verisimilitude and let players make reasonable plans. It also emphasizes the surprise and intrigue of the instances of randomness when you do use them. So having some kind of balance, uh, I think, is going to be important. Uh, I, I just can't, can't railroad, right? Let them go off the rails. Um, yeah. So if, you know, for example, I was playing um, uh, Slumbering Ursine Dunes uh, the other, like, last year. Um, and sort of the direction our characters went was very like eccentric and unusual and driven by what we had established in the previous fiction. So I, I don't want to say you can't do that, right? Um, so that that's important. Um, this is extremely important player ingenuity over character ability this is uh oh boy this is gonna be this is gonna be the biggest challenge for me to design around i think um because um what i have set up here this is running from the assumption that what is on the character sheet is important to the way the scenario ought to play out right like the progression on the character sheet is going to um describe the arc from the adventurers being unwitting fools in a situation to being empowered enough to actually fight arnwinder um and Generally, one of the best things about OSR play that I've experienced as a player is, yeah, you just avoid getting to dice. You don't, you don't go there, right? You, you know, in a lot of, um, in a lot of games, there is the principle of um, roll dice or say yes, right? Uh, but it's like if they, if they run into opposition, you should get them to roll dice. But that's not really how OSR games work. Um, it's more like you present a problem, the PCs try to think their way around it, like exploit their environment um, and the fiction they've established. And then if that goes wrong, you go to dice. Um, so I need to make sure that even if the players have an opportunity to uh, become empowered by becoming Ayn Heriar, uh, they still have the opportunity to interact with Arnmunder in a way that is not um, simply going to a climactic battle at the end, right? Um, they should have alternate options for how to deal with Arnmunder uh, that are reliant on fictional positioning and not reliant on um, not reliant on uh, on having big stats, right? Um, so cleverness should be awarded, not thwarted. Exactly. Clever solutions to a problem should usually work as long as they are within the realm of possibility. Uh, this is a, like GM advice, not really relevant. Um, let them manipulate the world. Uh, the focus of the game should be on creative problem solving, not brute force. So give players the tools to make that appealing. When you give players tools, you give them new ways to engage with the world. So again, there's this focus on clever manipulation, and I need to design around that. Make tools unique. Uh, so I need to populate the world with cool tools to use. Um, I can't just be like giving nice setting description or introducing cool characters. Um, I need to make sure that the, the, the environments have stuff that presents problems and solutions. Um, offer tough choices. Uh, so this is the emphasis on risk versus reward. Uh, this is about presenting 
situations um, where there are uh, multiple choices that can be made, decisions that can be made um, that are uh, difficult to uh, resolve, right? It's not clear which is, which is the best option. Um, and uh, build challenges with multiple answers. So this is really important. Avoid singular choke points in progress. Give them obvious and equally uh, but differently difficult alternatives. Uh, you can also keep an extra option in your pocket that they have to dig for. Maybe it's obscure but preferable. Maybe it's just as difficult but more beneficial. So having like a dichotomy, right? Having two options and then having a hidden third option. Right? That's something to keep in mind when I'm thinking about designing areas. Um, and challenges with no answer, right? So I have that, right? If you if you if if the PCs go up against a giant and they're not Ein Harriar, chances are they're just gonna die. Like the no, like you're dead, you're wrong, like you're imprisoned, uh, you're fed to the wolves, uh, you're crushed. I mean like just don't even bother like they are not to be fucked with um yeah uh and subvert their expectations i feel like i'm kind of doing that with the idea that the valkyrie is cunning right the valkyrie is tricky uh the valkyrie is a a, a, a osr character in a way that she's she's trying to approach things through um being intelligent rather than uh, approaching them through being strong. Um, I think that's good. I feel like the giant Arnwinder mm, kind of falls into existing expectations. Um, still, I think he still needs some work. Um, instill fear, fear and deal death. Uh, deadly but avoidable combat. I mean, that, that's gonna be no problem. Right, this is this is fine. Uh, we, I mean, we talked about the combat at the end. I need to worry about it being avoidable. Uh, keep up the pressure. Uh, this is like I'm thinking about the weather mechanic that I have in here. It's going to be really important um, for keeping up the pressure. Telegraph lethality. Um, this is something that is mostly the GM's responsibility. But as a designer, I want to give them the tools to describe uh, this lethality, right? That like, I want to have the hooks there that um, help them signal to the players where they have to worry about death. And let the dice kill them. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're totally down for that. Um, we, want, we want PCs to die in this module. Um, Reveal the world. Um, so this is kind of less important uh, for me as a designer as it as this one is. Uh, give them layers to peel back. Uh, so the PCs should have things that they are obviously aware of and things that are, require investigation to find, right? So I need to include uh, both layers of information in the module. Um, bring the world to life, improvisation and extrapolation, not rigid plots. Um, so yeah, worth, worth thinking about. Treat NPCs like real people. Yes. What do NPCs want? That is something that is common with Apocalypse World games, right? PBTA games. Uh, give them a motivation, right? Um... Only fanatical NPCs will fight to the death. Well, Armwinder is fanatical, right? So that is, uh, that's important. Um, maybe his, maybe his relatives are not, right? Uh, that, that's maybe an angle we can work on. Uh, so this is uh, not a principle or goal, uh, but um, ideas. Uh, Arnmunder's relatives are less zealous. Maybe. Um, uh, 
and uh, give the players a stake in the world. Uh, this is not important for what we're doing here. Our module is way too short. Um, I'm gonna, you know, the, the intention here is to uh, create a module that, that starts when the action starts. Like this is, this the, the, the setup for this module, I, I, I summarize in this tiny little intro text. Like that's as much as I want for intro. Like that's, that's it, okay? Like you got it, let's go, right? Like you don't get to turn down the Dukes. We're, we're doing this. Um, because uh, I have so little text to work with and uh, I feel like this is gonna be um, something that if GMs want to incorporate my work into their ongoing campaign, um, they can figure it out themselves, right? Like I don't, I don't need to, if like if this is Keep of the Borderlands, I don't need to worry about the Keep of the Borderlands. I just need to worry about the Caves of Chaos. Um, that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the keep. That is, that's the GM's business. They can they can come up with a come up with a hub for the players to work from. No problem. Um, there's like a billion products out there that do that, and and they have their own imagination. Um. See your world as real. Uh, yeah. Like, describe it. Give evocative detail. Important. And make your details matter. Um, again, not something I'm super great at. Uh, something I want to improve at. So, gonna do that. All right. Um, I think that covers most of the influences. I am going to take a brief break here uh, and I'm next going to talk a little bit about how I want to write the text, uh, what the style and form of the text should be. Yeah, so I will be back uh, momentarily.
Okay, I'm back. Um, so next thing I want to do here is to uh, talk a little bit about some of the Gauntlet products that already exist. So we, we took a brief look at, um, at the Wreck of the Void Hatred, um, but I want to take a look at Lauren's game, Game of Love, because I think it's really, really good at being concise and getting straight to the point and being readable and communicating its ideas. So, um, so the, the, this, uh, game, uh, starts with the title, who wrote it, you know, credits, um, subtitle, what's, what's the pitch? Uh, this is like, you know, the text you would find on a board game box describes general idea how many players does it take what is it about um next uh lauren uh she writes uh her motivation for writing the game um i i don't think i'm going to do this uh i think it might work better for a game text than uh for a module I kind of want to maintain that sort of authorly voice uh, in writing the module. Um, I think what I have here as this introduction is strong enough. I don't think that needs to be changed. <clears throat> uh, as far as, and then it, it continues, right? So this is this is her motivation. Um, so she's saying like, there's, there's stuff I love about uh, reality TV shows. Uh, however, there's problems with them too, right? So like, you know, what if we made our own reality TV shows that kind of did what we'd like to see instead of what is, uh, you know, uh, tired or, or is appealing to advertisers and conventional media. So, you know, this is a really strong pitch for the, why you might want to play this game, right? Uh, and then background information, and then uh, credits, uh, cool. Next, we get right into the procedure. Um, so this is a procedural text, which again is is not what I'm aiming for. I don't want I don't want this text to be procedural. Um, I think that's that's not how it should be written. That is um, something that's good for uh, game rules like this, uh, or it's good for like. Um, like a D20 module, but it's definitely not what I want for an OSR module. So there's, there is a rough procedure in the sense, right, that like, uh, for example, in Wreck of the Void Hatred, this is where you will probably enter the ship, the Void Hatred. And um, this is maybe where you would end up. Maybe, maybe not, right? But like, there is a sort of sense of working progressively from the bottom of the ship up to the quarter deck. Um, but it, it, it's not really a procedure. Um, and, and that's not what I want to do either. Uh, so I, I have, uh, I have a numbered procedure here, go here, then go here, then go here. But I don't want to make that, um, strongly dictated in the way that a, uh, a rules procedure would be. Okay, so we have uh, character creation. Um, so it communicates the, uh, the essentials of what your character should have. Uh, who are they? Why are they here? Why are they on the show? And then suggestions. Right, so uh, what are we talking about? What should the player do? And here's some ideas. That's a good structure. Uh, and then we move on to here. Um, this... In this case, I think it is assumed, 
it is kind of assumed that that the reader understands what a set is um and then they, you just move on to what should they do background information suggestions okay um And they're using imperative forms here, right? So, uh, or, or Lauren is, uh, she's, she's using imperative forms. So she's saying, um, discuss and, uh, you know, well, actually it's kind of only in this part, but there's a very sort of like immediate tone to the text, right? Like do this, now do this, like just, just do it. Like, let's move on. This is what is important get it get your attention on what we're doing here um again i don't feel that is appropriate for a module text uh but i like i like this as a kind of length and um i think this would be good for the gm instructions right so if we look over here um at the wreck of the void hatred uh we can get the the background information right and then a little bit more information for the gm uh, and some technical information i feel as though um i want a bit of this but i also want a little bit of uh this kind of thing a little bit of sort of candid uh, instructions from the writer to the GM. Um, yeah, I think that could be good to have like a paragraph of that sort of writing. Um, okay, so here are like these are instructions, um, and then we get into the procedure. Everybody should write down their character, and there's a formula for writing them down right um and examples uh and then I ideas and like these are really good um like this is really good uh what do you call it uh genre adaptation right um so the front runner financially stable bland conventionally attractive individual so if we compare this to like an osr character um I like the uh, the direct recourse to attributes. So if you look at my um, if you look at my character descriptions here, uh, she appears in many guises, manipulates events to her advantage, drives a hard bargain. She is fearless and cunning. Right, that's all we need. And I'm trying to do something similar to what is is here. Right. Um, this is less terse. Um, it's more like, you know, full form sentences. Uh, but generally very to the point, the eye candy, this person is super hot, vapid, and usually a wham, a waiter, actor, or model. Um, so like, that's about the length I want for a character description. Um, and you know, these are all really good ideas, right? Like these, these are all just like, uh, suggestions that are immediately comprehensible and, and communicate the, the sort of core conventions of the genre. Um, so for example, if I'm writing about the, uh, the forms of my Valkyrie of Uglihildr, um, some kind of point form list like this, very short, uh, even shorter than this would be, uh, would be good like a tribute brief description of how it is like uh, a tribute context right that's that's kind of what i want to do um and then you get uh some intro scenes uh so this could be useful but i don't think i'm going to have room for it um in my text there probably won't be enough room to give this kind of like, well, maybe this is how it starts or maybe that's how it starts. No, like it's going to be like, this is how it starts. If you want to come up with something else, that's up to you. But, you know, the, the thing is, they are part of the Fairweather company. 
they're going up the mountain. That's the situation. Um, okay, and then you have the, the first scenario. So this is this is where it starts to get into like the kind of writing that would be more relevant to a module, right? Because it's a situation. Um, so in reality dating shows, there's always the first uh, call of people who just aren't that interesting. Um, during the first cut, one player takes on the role of suitor while the other players each choose a character from those with the fewest relationships. The suitor will then frame a scene at an elimination ceremony and then invite these characters one at a time to pitch why they should remain on the show. After the pitch, the suitor will then choose one contestant to continue while the rest go home, done in the style of a dramatic elimination speech. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's so terse. It's good. It's very to the point. Um, and I think that's kind of what I want to shoot for in describing, like, the weather mechanics, right? Um what is the distinction between the weather in this game and in a normal game of macchiato monsters um how does it play into the situation and then what is the likely outcome uh here's some like sort of extended uh flavor with examples and i think i, I actually will in in talking about the weather i probably will include one or two examples um like the, the example i talked about earlier with uh um, you know, opening a door and somebody just like getting flung out into a hurricane force wind and dying. Um, and then this is more procedure. Um, I think this is not like uh, this. This is essentially analogous to an OSR uh, random generation table, right? Like these are a list of ideas. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to be using a table like this, right? That's, that's what I'm doing. So not a whole lot of, um, there's, there's not a whole lot of, uh, things to be gained there other than to say, if something is not obvious what it ought to be, then give some details, right? Um, that get across the, the point right away. Um, and we can see that so here um, a lot of this stuff is more mechanical text right it's like the ship tilts 1d8 degrees to port um, and there's like a mechanic for uh the characters suffer one, minus one movement for every 10 degrees of tilt. When it reaches 45 degrees, characters have 1d4 rounds to escape before everything tumbles into the gorge. Each time the tilt increases by more than five degrees, standing humanoids must save or fall and slide five, uh, not, uh, five feet uh, to port. So this is like, as much as this is like good D and D writing, good OSR writing, um, it's it it doesn't um, doesn't really speak to me in terms of being an author or a writer myself. Like I don't want to like even though I ha I did spend a week earlier this year like making up hex crawl tables and like researching the average travel speed of a canoe versus a kayak and all of that kind of thing that that is totally osr it's not what i want to spend my text on in this uh particular module um so i want to include things more like what i see here as interesting suggestions for what could be around and I want to have them follow the principle of having the details matter and making them specific right 
they should be specific details um, that, uh, you know, this is a thing that uh, Jason was, Jason Cordova was just talking about on Fear of a Black Dragon is um, if you are inserting something that is going to change the game world, make sure it is sufficiently specific to be interesting. Um, so the, if we look back here at Wreck of the Void Hatred, this mechanic, Fire and Fall, is roughly the equivalent of a Dungeon World custom move, right? Uh, it's mechanized in a very different way because it's using um, physical language that Dungeon World tends to not use. Uh, but it's very specific, and that makes it interesting. That's great. Uh, I'm just not quite as interested in talking about um, space in the way that this uh, this is doing here. And, yeah, like, I mean, th this is great, right? Like... If you were to convert this into an OSR game, like it could be group date table and one on one date table, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much data you're going to do in an OSR game, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. Um, uh, you know, uh, I could I could see it happen. Uh, so yeah, and then of course these are like super great summaries of genre stuff like they're they're like uh mildly ridiculous um situations that you might see on a reality tv show um like oh let's let's have a date that is is doing yoga with dogs um as someone who's done yoga for many years i don't endorse the practice of doing yoga with dogs <laughs> I think it's very silly. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know, to each their own. Um, and ending the scene. Uh, so this is the, the conclusion. And again, this is this is something I should look at because my my ending to the extent that I include one in the module is probably going to be one of the most important parts of what I'm writing. Um, so this is all procedural stuff. Um, cut to an elimination ceremony. Have the suitor frame up the elimination ceremony, summarize how the dates went, and then dramatically state who is safe and who, who will be going uh, home. So, you know, really important there is this word. This word is doing a lot of work. Um, remember, contestants can help and hinder each other during the card phase, depending on their relationships with each other. Um, so this is like a qualification or uh, extra information. Uh, I, I would like to include something like this. Um, and then how does it wrap up? The eliminated contestant should then give a brief confessional about their experience on the show with tears tantrums and or heartfelt goodbyes um so this could be like you know the the valkyrie congratulates them on on their good work or something else happens right uh there there should it should it should just be like a suggestion of how it might end instead of um dictating uh, you know, similar to what you might see in a, 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 a D20 module. Um, so extra rules. Uh, this is, again, something that would be relevant. Um, this is similar to my weather rules or my uh, Einherjar rules. Um, and then suggestions for dramatic moments is, again, like, totally something analogous to event tables um and the end game this is a uh, once again procedure so yeah it's uh and then they got a nice picture there <laughs> the picture i will leave up to people doing art uh, that's not my my concern um yeah so uh 
I think what I, I'm, I'm seeing here in terms of lessons to take away is um, have some parts of the text that directly address the GM, uh, have some parts of the text that are tables for ideas, um, include a little bit of procedure, very little bit of procedure, and include suggestions for the um, the turning points in the game, I would say the turning points, the 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 transition phase between, uh, let's say, these areas, the intro, and then the transition between these areas, and then the conclusion. But they, they, they should only be suggestions um, and descriptions, right? Uh, that's something that I have to include that the, the final girl does not because um, the whole point of having a module is to, to give context to play. Um, whereas the point of rules is more focused on what this, what this stuff is doing and not what I'm writing. Um, yeah, cool. So, uh, I like all of that. That's good. So I'm going to write some things down. So writing, writing. So stuff from, uh, let's take ideas from Final Girl. So address the GM directly and concisely to communicate new concepts. Give very brief uh, examples, maybe, possibly with the Valkyrie. Uh, possibly with the Ein Harrier mechanic, but maybe not. Um, uh, give suggestions for uh, play phase transitions. Uh, give narrative suggestions. Don't be too prescriptive. Um, what else are we talking about here? Uh, I mean, and you know, this includes the conclusion, including conclusion. Uh, and Oh, right. Uh, use tables to communicate genre information. Provide uh, explanation by example when uh, communicating unfamiliar concepts. Um, and and ah, uh, yes. Uh, describe key NPCs by attributes and brief context. Uh, Brief 
context for action. Okay, that's good. So let's go. Let's go back to void hatred. I mean, this is a this is a a, a principle that I think I'm coming to, which is. Um, don't all oh, right also uh, right here be specific uh, don't lean too hard on physical and mechanical language. I feel like that is something that may be characteristic of early OSR products or main mainstream OSR products. Um, so for example, if we take a look at Veins of the Earth, um, if we take a look at the rules for climbing, Just waiting for my uh, external, for my NAS to, to load. Um, so here's the, the climbing rules. Um, and you can see that uh, the degree of difficulty of climbing uh, is partially dictated by uh, this kind of uh, physical language here. But um, generally, I think this is this is closer to what I want to do, which is, you know, giving sort of more general description um, in terms of using a lot of adjectives. And declarative statements um, in plain English instead of using a lot of kind of engineering type language. Um, yeah, so I don't want to lean too hard on that, but I don't have the room to be as verbose as uh, something like Veins of the Earth. So, um, I, uh, but don't be verbose, right? Not that I don't like that kind of thing, but <laughs> I don't have the luxury. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, so let's, 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 uh, let's take a look at the rest of Wreck of the Void Hatred here, because I think there's plenty left to learn. Oops, that's not going to help us. Um, maybe I'll just, yeah, there we go. Cool. All right. So wreck of the void hatred. Uh, what can we take away from here? All right. So as we said, we have this, this intro text, um, what happened what happened here? What is happening? Right? What do the characters know? And um, rules information. So start, so uh, setting description should be what happened, what do the characters know, um, rules description, this is, this is a, this is not 
Wreck of the Void hatred, but uh, my personal thoughts. Uh, so we need to refer uh, to the Macchio Monsters text uh, for rules, um, except when modifying them. Which we will do a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. Um, and and uh, the uh, rules modifications rules modifications should be um, clearly set off from the rest of the text. I'll leave it up to a layout person to decide where that needs to go because there are people who are much smarter than me dealing with that kind of thing. All right. Um, so the, the, the setting itself, what do we have here? Uh, we have the title. Um, and now we've got uh, what is happening. Uh, what is the context? Uh, what's the subsetting? And what are the verbs the party can use to interact with this area? Um, And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if this is what I want to do. Because there's that thing we talked about from the Principia about giving obvious information and hidden information. So I like the qualified language here. A character can climb into the hold starboard, right? They can if they want to. Um, climbing to the bridge might require the skills of a burglar. So it's not being entirely prescriptive. Uh, this is prescriptive, right? Um, the GM rolls three event dice when player characters enter a new compartment, fight for two rounds, linger too long, or make too much noise. Assign one die each to the fire and fall and haunting event tables, discarding the leftover die. The deck, each deck has its own event die. Um, and this is, this is quite interesting. Uh, because... The, okay, yeah, so this is like general information for navigating the ship, which I like. And then we don't actually get to the specific setting information, the specific subsetting information until the next section. So I kind of like this idea of the general setting right and then the specific setting and then i would like to have some kind of uh i 
I'd like to have some kind of um, box text, or not box text, but uh, set off text like this for each section of the dungeon crawl. Uh, each of these um, areas, these areas, describing how the weather interacts with the area. I think that would be good. When should the GM do um, rolls on the weather table? How do different forms of weather interact with the area? Okay. I like this. And, and the, I don't think I want to be quite as prescriptive as the rules are about uh, the... Um, the way that the, the, the whole engine thing works uh, on the ship in uh, Void Hatred, but uh, I do want to be specific, and I do want to give a clear guideline for the GM uh, when to interact with that system and how that system interacts with each area. So, um, so describe general areas uh, and include clearly marked text or marked paragraphs to describe rules interactions specific to the area. And this should include, uh, so for uh, Stormlord, we want to have um, weather interactions. Uh, so there will be a, there, there will be a weather table for each uh, of the, um, each of the sections of the dungeon. Uh, oh, the overall dungeon. Each place will have its own weather table um, because, or no, 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 that's not right. There will be an encounter table and then there will be an overall weather table. So yes, uh, weather interactions. When does the GM roll? Uh, roll and... Uh, how does the weather manifest in the area, right? Because if you have a blizzard, it's going to be a different manifestation inside of the fortress compared to what it would be on the mountainside, right? Um, so give suggestions. Um... Okay. So here's a specific area description. How many compartments are there to the area? Well, this is interesting. So the this is a pacing mechanic. When you enter a new compartment, then you roll the event dice, right? And so it would be, in the case of the hold, there's one compartment, you enter the compartment, the GM... Uh, oh, okay, reconnection is successful. Um, so, yeah, so uh, what I'm saying is that uh, I want to have opportunities for the characters to rest up until the weather becomes so severe that it's no longer possible. Um, so I don't feel like it's enter a room and then boom you get hit by a grind right like this is this is this is functioning like a grind clock from torchbearer right this is a pacing mechanic um which is not quite what i'm interested in um although i mean i you know props to richard for coming up with this because it's really really uh it's a really good conceit for um writing something this brief uh, it, it, it adds a lot of punch um, and it communicates a lot in a very little text. 
Okay, so setting description. Uh, the hold has much of the ship's loot and supplies, but if it is not emptied before the engines blow, everything will be lost. Um, so establishing stakes. Uh, there is a uh, five foot by three foot uh, rupture along the starboard side. Barrels of sour ale and dried fish have broken open and coils of rope have unspooled. Yes, this, this is good. These are details. These are, these are mundane details that communicate the environment. Um, this is something we'll see in the Principia, it's in the addenda, I believe. 30 Principles for Adventure Design by Bryce Lynch. Summary by John Miller. Um, hooks. Treasure. Non-magical treasure should relate to the setting and give clues or information about monsters, NPCs, locations, etc. So, this is doing that, right? Barrels of sour ale. Why is the ale sour? Because it's been there too long. Um, dried fish have broken open uh, and coils of rope have unspooled. Um... So it, it, it communicates the chaos of the situation. And however, this is still potentially useful. Uh, these are still potentially useful elements of the environment that can be interacted with uh, by the players. So it does a double roll. And that's what we want in our, our description of, of, of items, of mundane items. Um, the value of everything you can find is denominated in currency, in gold. Uh, so in Macchiato Monsters, um, these are uh, denominated in risk die. Uh, no, no, uh, in dice, right? Uh, each item is assigned a die value. It's not assigned a particular value in GP. Uh, and core mechanics, as far as advancement goes, leveling up. Um, I think this is probably a separate... Probably on the character sheet. Character sheets, English. No. <laughs> uh, How do you level? <laughs> This is a pretty core important thing I need to worry about, so let's let's take the time to think about it. Um, so this game has no experience points, as you can see here, right? So this is, you know, uh, I was talking about how important treasure for XP is, but that's not really the case here, right? Um, when we're talking about Macchiato Monsters, it's a little bit different than uh, most uh, OSR games. Q. 
Characters level up after reaching a number of goals equal to their next level. Each goal is defined by players and referee together. Some examples, clear a goblin nest, rescue a lost knight, find out who killed the innkeeper, explore a portion of wilderness, bring back enough gold to fund the next expedition, travel through a haunted forest, steal the duke's ring, and so on. Uh, some goals may be more, uh, more difficult or time consuming than others. The number of sessions spent reaching is up to the group, but one or two is a good average. Uh, start each session by listing the party's goals, adding new ones to the list, and removing unwanted ones. It's never too late to update the list if the characters accomplish something noteworthy. A fair referee can also, referee is the word for GM in this game, can also grant half goals if you came close but uh, couldn't entirely cross an objective off the list. Uh, the, the referee may let each character have a goal that is unique to them. I would not allow more than one of these active at any time, and only one can be reached during a given session. Uh, can I read this? Oh, is it added because it's fun. Okay. Um, cool. So, um, I think this this changes things, right? This this really changes uh, the design design principles from what we were talking about in the Principia. We have to reconsider uh, because uh, Makioto Monsters has um, a different notion. Because right, because we had uh, you know the tre treasure for XP was something really key that we talked about from the Principia, uh, and something important that we see in Wreck of the Void Hatred. However, in Macchiato Monsters, which is the game we are actually using, uh, we are not talking about that. So let's let's uh, let's have a little bit of a note here. I don't know if this is a writing note so much as it is a mechanic. So let's talk about. So um, we're talking about uh, advancement is by player set goals, not by treasure acquisition. That's going to dramatically change the design of the module. Because I was thinking that I need to build this around treasure acquisition and take into account the fact that players will be more motivated by acquiring treasure than they will be by uh, than they will be by uh, you know achieving an obvious goal like defeating Arnmunder. However, uh, given what we can see here in uh, Macchiato Monsters, um, it's much more likely that they would take on Arnwinder with this system. Um, defined by players and referee together. So each goal is defined by players and referee together. Okay. So not, well, we can just make a comment, not by treasure acquisition. So what does that say about writing um, this game? Uh, well, first of all, one thing we want to do is downplay the importance of treasure relatively relative to uh, standard standard if you can call it that um yeah, downplay the importance of treasure relative to standard OSR. Uh, and 
Um, instead, instead of that, we want to look at something more like what we saw in here, right? Um, these kinds of suggestions. Um, the goal in, in a game of love is set, right? There's, there's only one way to win the game. Um, however, there are these kinds of suggestions for uh, creating the fiction, right? Um, and it, it doesn't, so um, it says the, the, the suitor uh, establishes a scene. So the suitor will be the, the GM figure here. Um, and in the case of Macchiato Monsters, the, the goal should be set mutually, right? This is a conversational thing. So um, instead of talking about, uh, we're, instead of talking about um, coming up with treasure that is intensely desirable, but also um, liquid like liquid like it can be converted to gold pieces and thereby to experience points and also um narratively enticing right uh instead of that uh we want to provide suggestions for where to take the conversation over goals right uh and this it says each goal should be resolved one or two per session is a good average so what we're saying here is maybe um okay so we're, let's 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 say this uh, let's um, provide uh, goal suggestions, not jail suggestions, goal suggestions uh, per uh, area, right? Um, so these could be uh, session goals, right? Um, and provide uh, quest goal suggestions. Um, and these would be, uh, these would be, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, like quest, they're, they're quest goals, right? Uh, provide quest goals, suggestions, multiple sessions, right? Um, and as part of the Ein Harriar rules include... Ein Herjar goal suggestions. So these are things that uh, these are things that um, the Ein Herjar might be compelled to do by Uglahildr, and then they would become goals. So it would be good because on the one hand you have um, the push, right? The push from uh, the GM spending or the the whatever they're called uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm sorry I don't mean to be disrespectful to the text uh, the referee yeah the referee um, on the one hand you have the referee um, pushing the player by using uh, Uglahildr's stock right their 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 hold over the player uh, but on the other hand if the player gets um if the player gets an Ein Herjar goal then that is an opportunity for them to advance however <laughs> ooh. okay this is this is making me think here this is, the gears are moving um 
in from, from a rules design perspective. So if the Ein Harriar is incapable of leveling, um, it means that even if they fulfill the goal that has been given to them by Uglahildr, um, they will not personally benefit from that. However, if we make the Ein Harriar goals contribute to group advancement, uh, then that could that could pr produce an interesting effect where at the um, the meta level, right, the level the the level of meta play um, outside of the context of player uh, PC motivations um, or even individual player motivations as a controller of a PC, um, the players could be mechanically incentivized to play up the conflict uh, between those characters in the party who are still human and those characters in the party who are Ein Harriar under the influence of Uglehildr, right? And th th what that will do is it will, um, it will press the, uh, the players to advance uh, the story towards Uglahildr um, taking control and, uh, and uh, driving towards the final uh, conflict with Armunder, but in a way that is true to uh, each character, right? Because... Because we represent the progression as a internal conflict in the party, um, it has narrative significance for each player instead of just being a thing that is like a clock that is advancing, right? That is independent of the party dynamic. Um, okay, so so um, okay, so let's say this. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So. Um, when uh, Uglahildr spends a hold to compel a PC to uh, act, she, uh, so, uh, the The referee states the task she assigns to the PC, and this becomes a goal for the party. Fulfilling the goal Uh, gives party um, advancement no, 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 no. advances the level of PCs um, of all PCs except uh, the Ein Harriar who cannot level. Okay. That's, I think that's clear. Uh, all right. Cool. Good, I like that. I mean, we're obviously, like, this is something I have to see how it works in play testing, but um, I think it's the, it is a, good core mechanic uh for that for 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 advancing the narrative agenda right and i feel like we're pushing away now from uh the direction that i was driving at with that sort of um like pure osr orientation and going back towards something that is a little bit more uh fiction driven um so that's that's interesting. Um, I, I like I like how the rules of Macchiato monsters have intervened in this process. Um, 
Cool. Like it. And I mean, this is the great thing about, like, this is the great thing about um, OSR games. And even though, like, this, what we're doing here in terms of advancement is not standard OSR, uh, what is great about this stuff is it's it's so hackable and it's so like, oh okay like I'm I have this idea for the module I have um, this mechanical notion and now I'm just gonna change it like I'm just gonna I'm just gonna modify the rules I'm just gonna go do it like I love that about OSR games it's so much fun to be able to just sort of like freely fuck with the rules design um, in a way that isn't possible in more uh, sort of like uh, tightly and um, intricately designed games. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, feeling that. That is feeling good to me. Um, I'm definitely going to need to I'm going to need to rethink some things here. So rest and supply should matter. I just think that's still true. High lethality is still important. Show the force of nature is still important. Respect the dice, but remember the core conflict? Absolutely still important. Um, treasure. So I want there to be... Make non magical treasure setting evocative and useful and 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 fictionally useful. Uh, but like, but but don't overdo it, right? Because we don't need to provide um, as much treasure types uh, as we see in something like this, right? Um, like 2d8 casks of rum. This is a very OSR thing, right? Like, oh, okay. Like, I am not going to give you a um, a bag of gold that you can just go pick up and then that's instantly XP for you. No, it's like uh, every item that you get should be a material thing um, instead of just being, uh, you know, a very simple uh, uh, advancement reward uh, in the form of gold coins. Right, you know, if you get gold coins, that's fantastic. Like you get a chest of Electrum ingots, or ingots, sorry, ingots. Yeah, uh, I always get that mixed up. <laughs> uh, but um, but even here, right? These are ingots. They're they're not coins, right? Uh, they're they're more physically meaningful, and that's good. But um, we don't need to s focus on providing mundane treasure for the sole purpose of uh, providing advancement rewards for the party. We're oriented towards goals here. We're not oriented towards um, treasure acquisition, right? Uh, so that does change the, the focus of writing uh, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. so I still want to have this kind of stuff but not uh, as much of it right and one thing I'll say I really like about this module which isn't perhaps super relevant well maybe it is I don't know um, there's a, there's a thing when I first read over it, I was thinking like, uh, like, why is there so many, uh, 
why are there so many cases where you roll up the number of bodies in an area, right? Like, like do I really care as a player if there are five bodies or six bodies? But if you actually look at the way the mechanics work, um, you there's a hauntings table, and um, you have mechanics like this. Half of the humanoid bodies in the compartment reassemble themselves and attack. Right. So the the thing you've established in the area then becomes a situation by way of the role, right, of, of the hauntings role. So I, I really like that, it's very cool. Um, I need to do stuff like that. So, um, Tables, uh, tables with a guiding mechanic, right? Uh, some of these should, I think, mm, maybe there will be like one or two. And I feel like these kind of folk or function, they function in a way. that are, is kind of analogous to clocks in Blades in the Dark, but not really. Um, they're machines for producing situations, right? Um, they're somewhere in between clocks and, uh, clocks and custom moves, right? Clocks, uh, in Blades versus uh, custom moves in PBTA, right? I mean, obviously there are clocks in PBTA games as well, uh, but um, outside of something like uh, the Sprawl, they're not quite mechanized in the same way. Um, cool. There's also like the mission clock in Night, uh, Night Witches, but yeah. Um, so they, there are tables with a mecha guiding mechanic. So it's like, um, think, think custom move, custom move plus clock, which like especially is the case, um, because Macchiato Monsters uses uh, risk die, risk dice, which count down, right? They count down like clocks do. Um, yeah. So I mean, the general encounter tables for each area will kind of be this, but. I may want to include like one or two of these these tables with a guiding mechanic. Maybe include one or two. Cool. So example, uh, hauntings clock, or hauntings <laughs> hauntings table. <laughs> Um, cool. And then these are like the cool treasures. So these get, these get some description in the way we saw with meet our mark, right? What is the description? What is the effect? Okay, so let's talk about treasure then. 
treasure. Uh, around three really significant items. Uh, include, uh, so uh, this is um, set off from main text, uh, includes context, background, uh, location, uh, uses, as well as uh, rules, includes rules, right? Um, or only around three of these, not a lot, especially because we have these on Harry R rules being in there. It's gonna take up some space. Um, And this is a thing that we also see in the Principia. Um, give evocative descriptions of magic items. Give concrete descriptions of their appearance and how they must be manipulated to produce their magical effects. Use magic items to evoke a sense of wonder. Yes, 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 yes. So what do we see here with the magic items in, in, uh, in the wreck? Um, eh, it's okay, you know, not not super hot on this. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm being a little bit harsh there, but uh, they're functional. These are functional, but they're not that interesting. Like they have eldritch engravings, but. Mm, um, what kind of Eldritch engravings, you know? Give me a couple adjectives here. Give me some purple prose. I love my purple prose. <clears throat> okay. Um, this, very cool. Very cool. This is so good. I love this. Uh, Duke Lurissus's heart. Um, alchemist prized demonic hearts. Eaten raw, a quarter portion of heart can either heal all damage, cure any disease or poison, or remove any curse but its own. Uh, at an appropriate time, once each day, the GM may require the healed character to save or immediately do something treacherous and cruel involving betrayal, uh, deception, murder, or theft. No spell can remove the curse for uh, 1d6 years. So because of the nature of the module I'm writing, uh, which is very to the point and doesn't have much in the way of context, um, we're not going to see this, right? We're not going to see um, a full paragraph of flavor text, uh, right? So, you know, we're talking here about, like, uh, the war gear of Saul the Daystar. Well, it's like this is meaningful because we've read elsewhere in the text who that is. Right. We've also read um, about uh, Bjorngrim, the dra dragon slayer, uh, the black worm, um, uh, and uh, we've heard about uh, Scat Hotch, life stealer. Right. Um, so, so we we know about these things from other sections of the text, but we're not going to have that in my module. So what that means is. Um, Um, so this is going to be, the context will be, uh, not, so, uh, relatively little about item background, more about item appearance and what will we say affordances, right? Um, to use a philosophy of technology term, like what does it let, what does it afford you? What kind of experience does it afford you? What can you do with it? What can, it, what does it do to you? Um, that's, that's, that's what we're interested in. And then we're gonna have the rules. So mostly 
mostly rules, a little bit of flavor, right? Um, not as much as you see in Meter Mark because that has more background information that's been established and can be can be used as hooks. Okay, uh, that's 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 it. Um, so. Uh, didn't look through all of this stuff. Uh, I like these these situations. Like this is pretty funny, you know. The uh, whim the cabin boy fell into a boiling pot of fish stew. I mean, it's it's, it's horrible. It sounds sounds absolutely terrible, but it's it's kind of funny nonetheless. It's a kind of grim black black humor, right? Um, and and sort of absurd situations that have been created by the disaster. Um, stat blocks, right? Uh, so stat blocks. Either included, okay, so uh, it should be um, included in the uh, tables with the item they describe, or uh, if it is a mandated encounter, because remember, there's both. We talked about that in the Principia. Uh, included in uh, setting text alongside introduction of encounter, right? So then the the uh, the, the the referee is not um, flipping back and forth through the text. That's terrible. We don't want to do that. It's bad. Okay. And we'll say you know lots of things to roll, right? It's an obvious thing. So this is describe specific areas, right? Describe specific areas. So things to roll, uh, situations to describe. Example, boy falls in pot of stew, right? Um, and what that does is if you roll up the ghost of the the boy who fell in the pot of stew, then the GM has something fun to play with, right? In terms of uh, providing them with characterization. Um, yeah. And let's say... Now, I'm interested to see how much this gives you multiple solutions to the problem. So it's doing the thing of not not uh, creating bottlenecks, right? There's, there's one way here and there's another way here. You can move around. But we can't, the thing is, we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be fairly abstract about areas, right? Because we're, on, we're kind of on the level of like this main deck area, right? There's three compartments. Um, we wanna describe all of that in one little section. Uh, we can't say, we can't give a room by room description of the Dwarven Fortress, 
or the the Stormlord's Fortress, for that matter, or uh, you know each each uh, each leg of the journey um, up the mountain. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna want to do something like this where. Um, We're describing points of interest. Uh, not every room. Okay. And compared to what we see in this module, I feel like I want to give a little bit more in the way of environmental problems to deal with. Because, yes, like we have these things, you know, these are all significant, but they tend to be things that are, um, they, they, there are things that force the PCs to react, right? Um, I want a few more things in this in this module I'm writing, not a lot, but some that are problems the PCs can kind of solve because I think it's important to an OSR module. And I mean, Richard knows way more about <laughs> he knows way more about OSR modules than I do. Uh, but based on what it says in the Principia, I do want to provide a little bit more in the way of. Um, environmental puzzles, uh, environmental problems to solve. Uh, and a lot of those will be emergent from the roles uh, and the way the narrative has gone and the ecology and all those kind of things. But I do want to provide, you know, just a few things that are um, set. And I don't want these to be like extremely forced puzzle encounters that you have to overcome, like you see in a, a you know, a Keep on the Shadowlands, the fourth edition module. Uh, I want to see um, things that are a result of the chaos of the of the situation and what preceded it, right? Like. You know, um, a really good touchstone here, I think, is uh, Half Life, right? The 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 Black Mesa complex uh, is a huge dungeon to explore. It's a big dungeon crawl, right? And uh, the puzzles that they create in uh, Black Mesa um, that Valve created in Black Mesa are p puzzles that follow from what kind of facility it was and then what it has been transformed into because of the interdimensional chaos, which is totally what we're going for here, right? So um, design goal, uh, make the uh, op opposition follow from what uh what what am i calling this thing uh shathurazan was and what the chaos has caused think Black Mesa. Cool. And I think the last thing I want to take away from this, um, I want to mention, I want to remember for describing specific areas is have the environment and items 
describe or evoke evoke and allude to character relationships because that's interesting that is um if you look at uh, dark souls right so good at doing this um they're totally riffing off of osr stuff there right um you get these items in particular meaningful locations um, and the the item text which is an, a, a stand-in for the GM uh, describing this stuff to you uh, helps to tell the story of what kind of place it was and what has happened to it um, so yeah think think Dark Souls Think Dark Souls. Always think Dark Souls. <laughs> Dark Souls is so good. All right. Um, good. Good, I like it. So, um, the last thing, the last, actual last uh, source I would like to take a look at is uh, Stone Dragon Mountain. Because this stuff about traveling is going to be relevant to the first stage of the module. So base camp, okay, we're not doing that. That's not part of this. We don't have time for it. We don't have space for it. The Dragon Wing Glacier. Yes. Yes. Mmm. So good. So good. If you're running this adventure as a one-shot or just want to skip straight to the mountain climbing, here is the suggested method for, do for doing so. Tell the players their characters a pass through base camp and give each one piece, uh, give them each one piece of information they glean from the list of information available on page 19. Start them at a location for Wing Glacier Canyon. If they return to base camp later before entering the mountain, set duress at two disgruntled. If they return after entering the mountain, set it to three hostile. Boom. Um, we're not going to do this because uh, it's assumed we're kind of this this module is sort of running on an accelerated time scale and we don't have tech we don't we don't have space for this kind of text but this is this is super good this is really good yeah nice um all right so let's 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 continue I don't think I have the energy to go through the whole text. Oh yeah, so good. Um, but I do want to take a look at the opening text here. When things go wrong on the mountain, and, and they will, Remember the awesome expanse of merciless ice, the recently creeping cold, and the hateful inhabitants. Also recall the majestic beauty, the exaltation of exploration, and the palpable presence of the gods. Use this list as an inspiration if you need a twist for a failed test, but don't hesitate to use a twist of your own if you have a better idea. Also, make sure to throw in a few conditions here and there. Conditions hurt, but they keep the action moving by allowing the adventurers to continue making progress. So as far as I know, Macchiato Monsters does not have con conditions. Does not have conditions. Wilderness travel. So here's the weather mechanics in Macchiato Monsters, right? This is what we're gonna modify.
Yeah. So we don't have that option. What we're going to end up doing a lot for uh, the the first stage of the um, the module will be uh, to make stat checks, right? Stat checks. We're gonna have stat checks. I mean, it's not as good as Torchbearer, but we also are, have reasons not to do Torchbearer. So, um, this is more similar to the way that uh, I saw um, mountain climbing handled in uh, Tomb of Annihilation, 5th fifth, fifth edition Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, it's also similar to uh, the complex, complex, what do you call it? Complex tests in 4th edition that were added in the um, DMG2. Uh, might do something like that as well. But not as systematized because this is an OSR game. So use stat checks. We don't have conditions. Um, but that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna lean on the GM to make rulings instead of rules, right? That's that's the whole OSR thing. So um, let's think about this from a perspective of it being a uh, possibility for good design instead of saying, well, it's not as fun as Torchbearer. <laughs> That's not productive at all. Uh, <laughs> no, we need to look for the opportunities here and not the uh, deficiencies. So these are hooks for what could happen. Like, this is good stuff, right? Um, this is, this is like not mechanized at all. This is not mechanized at all. This is something that could easily fit on like a table, right? Um, here as well. So these are fantastic, right? Like we're gonna take some of these ideas uh, because um, they're, si they're system independent, right? They're not particular to Torchbearer anyway. Um. Mm. Conditions. So let's see, does Macchiato Monster have any way that we could mechanically represent this? Disadvantage, right? So you are winded because of altitude sickness. You have disadvantage on tests involving XYZ, right? Um, And I like these details, right? Altitude sickness causes headaches, fatigue, indigestion, dizziness, nosebleeds, drowsiness, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so like this, this stuff is gonna be all relevant to what we're doing for stage one. Extreme cold. Extreme cold, uh, like I definitely see, um, like one idea I got from, uh, I believe it was, I believe it might, oh, it was from um, Meter Mark, the Meter Mark weather stuff, overland travel stuff. Um, thunder snow. Yeah, <laughs> fuck yes. <laughs> Gonna put that like on the, the, the weather table for sure. So you get some thunder snow going on. It's like, yeah, you're in the thunder snow and you see the form of a giant emerge from the white. What do you do? Um, good stuff. So like this stuff is overly mechanized for OSR, right? 
but it's good to know. So like we're not doing glacier traversal. I don't think. But yeah, I love all these like particular details. We can't give all of this stuff, but like we can we can distill it down into into uh, something something very uh, pithy, succinct. So wildlife and uh, weather. Um, environmental things like rock slides, avalanches, um, gorges to traverse. Um, point form description here is good. Something easy for the GM to read. Nice. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I think I need to end here because I'm just getting like lost in this module and wanting to run it so much. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, that's what happens when you read these things. So uh, I think that is going to be it for today. I haven't actually written any of the module, but I did a ton of research um, and came up with uh, good principles the next thing I'm going to do is revisit uh, Stone Dragon Mountain, do the same for that, and then get on to actually writing the damn thing. Um, prep, doing prep. Uh, this is this is the uh, the style of work they teach you in like uh, functional programming, right? Like you think out what you're going to do before you do it. Um, and then you go and test, and then you iterate that's what we're going to do so for uh, anybody who uh you know stuck around to listen to me blather on um thank you <laughs> and uh if anyone's watching this on youtube thank you for watching uh stay tuned because uh i will be doing more of these streams as this uh this um module comes together yeah so uh, I will see you next time.